Welcome back to Think Design Work Smart. I'm Alex Bulbak and I'm coming at you from the Mosaic Work Studios. And what I have for you today is something a little bit different. Uh, Adi and I were invited to do a keynote session in uh, Brescia and we really enjoyed uh, building this talk. And also one thing that happened is that um, in all the excitement, uh, our sound was not captured so they didn't get a good recording of the talk which is why we decided to record this both for youtube and for the conference organizers from the working software conference in brescia uh, and um, we would like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting us. Uh, that was a very fun event. And also because of this, I have with me Adi. Hi Adi, welcome back to the channel. Hello, thank you. It's been a while, but I know you've been very yeah. busy. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so um, a little bit of an introduction before we start just to make sure that our audience is not surprised. What we will do is we will assume that we are talking with the Italian audience in Brescia. <laughs> uh, so it will be a, a bit performative, right? Uh, we are now in uh, our corresponding studios, but uh, this is uh, you know, what we were invited to do. So we'll, we'll basically repeat kind of what we did at the conference. But with a slight change, we had a very short uh, time uh, span, uh, 30 minutes for the keynote. And today we don't have a, a limit. It might get to around 45 minutes uh, because we have a few things we can get more into while we, uh, while we work through the talk. Uh, so these are two things that I think are important for, for you to know before you watch this. Anything else, Adi, before we start? It's a very interesting topic, and I think uh, almost anyone can relate to. All right. So, uh, it's time to start. Hello, everybody. Uh, Welcome to this talk, Seven Attitudes for a Better Developer Life. And I will start with a story. I was in London a few weeks ago and I was uh, near the Paddington Station in London. There's a really nice Italian restaurant that was, it, it's a restaurant that's very clearly family owned. Uh, and it's been there from 1950s, 1950 something, 57 or something like that. And we were there for a conference and we go for dinner at this restaurant. I order minestone and uh, a pasta dish. The minestone is amazing, uh, very good. And it's obviously that they are very into food and cooking and all that. Uh, but the second dish is, uh, so is brought by somebody other than our waiter and, uh, I'm tasting it and it's not that great. Uh, I expected more from that restaurant. Um, and so, but I'm not saying anything because I don't want to upset anybody and the waiter comes back our waiter looks at me and immediately says oh this needs some chili oil and he brings me a bottle a big bottle of chili oil you know helps me pour the chili oil on top and then watches me kind of towers over me making sure that i'm mixing it correctly from uh, from um, beneath the pasta and everything is mixed right and so on and then when I taste it, it's like it's catching life. So it's very, very good. And uh, I found this very funny. I was When I was uh, leaving this moment, I thought, oh, I have to tell an 
the Italian audience that I'm going to speak in front of this story. At the end, the waiter looks at me and says, oh, people don't know how to eat. We have to teach them. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, I'm talking in front of an Italian audience and I only hope that they will bring the same passion for programming that this guy, this waiter has for eating and cooking and that I know many Italians do. So this is a very interesting part of uh, why I love this the event, this conference and what I am looking forward to. All right, uh, I'm Alex Bolbok, I'm CTO on Mosaic Works, and part of my work is uh, making sure that the infrastructure works, the Mosaic Works infrastructure works correctly. Part of my work is also creating learning programs, working with developers, working with product leaders, working with um, architects, helping them overcome various challenges, and particularly one thing where we at Mosaic Works uh, are known for and what we've specialized in is learning programs that change mindsets. So at the end of a learning program with us, not only you learn new techniques, but you also think slightly differently about the problems that you did before. Hello, I'm Adi. I'm a a VP at Mosaic Works. Typically, what I do is uh, also create learning programs, help all sorts of uh, teams do a various um, amount of activities from understanding their digital products, from creating new products, optimizing their workflow, looking at architecture, uh, some times and quite often management coaching and also strategic goal setting working together with uh, with management on different transformations that you want to have for for their organizations a, a broad set of things which i think are important nowadays for very complex ecosystem that we have uh, in the in software development, well, programming sometimes not that much these days, but I do some programming as well, testing, testing strategies quite a lot because uh, it's needed. And uh, one of the reasons for this talk is that we grew up with humanistic and enlightenment values, and the important part of enlightenment the thing that i retain is that happiness comes from knowledge knowledge comes from personal responsibility so enlightenment was a european intellectual movement uh, and the goals of humanity with enlightenment were considered to be knowledge freedom and happiness and these kind of connect to each other and of course this is not a perfect system, right? It has its own holes. Uh, but these are the things we grew up with. And for most, uh, most of my career, I've seen these values working, except in various circumstances uh, that are more, more specific. So when we talk about seven attitudes that help developers be happier, what we talk about is things related to this, knowledge and personal responsibility, learning things. So our beliefs due to this is that one, you are important. You are important as an individual because we don't know what is your top potential. Uh, and we encourage you to do as much as you can to reach your, top pot your full potential. You can learn, and by learning, you get to this uh, potential. And you have a, therefore, you have also personal responsibility to try to get there and to help others. 
and okay, these beliefs, as I said, are not perfect, uh, but they are part of what is uh, is driving us. And as coaches, we look at how we can help people achieve their full potential. And in doing so, we noticed a common issue, which is that often what limits people from reaching this full potential is not external things, but it's more internal things. It's something called limiting beliefs. So a limiting belief is a belief that you have that is blocking you from getting to the next level, from achieving your full potential. And now you might expect that programmers being very logical are not driven by beliefs. Psychologically, that's not true. Uh, you have to start from beliefs. And also logically, that's not true. If you think about Gödel's theorems, no logical system can be built that does not start from a set of axioms. So you have to start from uh, certain beliefs. So today we'll talk about limiting beliefs of programmers. We'll go through seven situations where we find these beliefs and we'll try to explain to you why there's a limiting belief and also how you can change your mindset so that it no longer blocks you and it helps you reach your full potential. A very common situation for programmers is that you work on existing code bases and quite often that's what we do. I think the vast majority of code that I see is existing code. It's existing code base that we need to add upon, we need to add new features, we need to change it slightly, we need to refactor it because it's not that performant, or we need to decompose it in smaller modules. There are many things that one needs to do on existing code. And that code is giving value to the business, so we need to keep it, otherwise it would be just gone. The issue with the, with the existing code is that it provides value, but it's difficult to make it better. And what we hear from developers are things like these uh, managers don't let us refactor, or we, we need to rewrite. If only we had, we had more time, if only we had the product owner who would let us do so other types of, of constraints that exist. And these are limiting beliefs because in fact, you can do these refactorings, you can improve this code, you can make it better. The only thing is that you need to apply certain techniques. For example, when I hear, I, I hear we don't, our managers don't let us refactor, you should try using baby steps. Instead of thinking that you need to refactor the whole program or the whole module or the whole system, try to see what you can do in a few hours, maybe a few days, that has an impact, that is providing value that is providing value now or soon for the few future features that you will add in the following weeks or months. And in this way, you will slightly improve your code. Then needing to rewrite is all, always something that programmers want because it's, it seems it feels easier to start from scratch, to start from nothing and rewrite the code. But what I saw is that for a very simple problem, if you want to rewrite it, you need at least three iterations to make it decent. So rewriting won't help you do a better job for the code. What rewriting will do is that you probably create new mistakes in other parts of the code. So. Also in this situation, you need to refactor. It's 
almost never the situation that rewriting will provide a better code overall. It might be slightly better, but not significantly better considering the effort that you need for writing. So refactoring is, is the way. The, the other constraints that we have here, like have more time, have managers that, or product owners that would, would leave us do this if we had more skills, if we had, etc. It means that you shouldn't, you just need to embrace your constraints. You need to look at what you can do with your current skills, with the current time, and do m most of it. Instead of saying, I cannot do anything because I don't have the perfect conditions, try to see what you can do. And these are limiting beliefs. I will give you one story of a programmer. I was coaching a team uh, and uh, we were discussing during a retrospective the fact that uh, a, a programmer was saying, I uh, want to refactor the code, but my manager do doesn't let us. And that felt weird because I had talked with the manager previously, the previous day, and I had a meeting the, this day as well. And then I, w I went back to the manager and asked, look, uh, the, the, the team is saying uh, they want to refactor this and you won't let them. Why is this happening? What's, what's the issue? And he said, well, nobody asked. Nobody asked me about this refactoring. And if they want to do it, sure. If it makes sense and I explained what it's doing, uh, he said, sure. It brings value to our product, so let's refactor. This is again a limiting belief that we, anyway, no, nobody will let us refactor. So why ask? Because anyway, it won't happen. So this is another constraint that uh, you put on yourself instead of focusing on what you need to do, communicating well, trying to improve in baby steps. Uh, and this is a way to overcome these limiting beliefs. And it's funny that uh, actually at the conference, I had a chat with um, one, I think he was one of the organizers, and he told me that at some point a programmer told him, you know, management doesn't let us refactor. And he was like, you know, I am the management <laughs> and I will let you refactor. But it was so ingrained that even in uh, even though they were the programmer was talking with the management, he didn't know he was talking with the management, and he still was saying, "No, they don't let us refactor. No, they don't let us refactor." <laughs> he almost didn't believe uh, him when he says, "But I, I'm letting you refactor." You know? <laughs> It was quite <laughs> interesting. Okay, second situations. Um, when requirements change, uh, it's often that requirements change in software development. And we know that we, well, to be honest, programmers kind of would like if nothing would change, if we would get a perfect set of requirements and then we would just be left alone to write code and um, then be praised for our amazing solutions and how well they are going, right? This would be the ideal world. And because of this, we hear from developers things like, you know, customers should make up their mind. They don't know what they want. Uh, business doesn't know what they want. And, or there are so many new things in technology we can't possibly keep up with all of those. Everything is changing. And it's true that there is a pace of change, but the problem here is these are limiting beliefs because they assume that we can change the world, that we can just stop everything around us. And, you know, slightly on a tangent here, but programmers are not the only 
ones who have deadlines. I am when I'm writing books, uh, I have deadlines, and it's okay. It's it's how things are. Um, so the world around you just doesn't change because you want it to change, and it doesn't stop. So it's important to understand here that software development is incremental, and you need to embrace change. Uh, and by incremental. The incremental part is very important because this is how we learn, actually. Customers learn by us providing something that looks like what they wanted and by them telling us, yeah, that's kind of it, but not quite, and this is what I like instead. Now that I've seen it, now I know what I like, what I want. And business is kind of the same way. They release something into the market and then they see the reaction and they say, okay, that thing didn't grow as much as we wanted. The other thing was much better than what we expected. So let's focus on the other thing instead of the, <laughs> the one that we thought was, um, you know, the key to success. And this is part of the incremental process is because software development and learning and product development, they are very closely connected. Everything is actually learning. And one way of doing this is by doing things incrementally, which may mean you have to do it in three different ways. Uh, first, let's say as a script, then as a semi-manual thing in your web application then as a fully automated thing maybe that would be a, a thing we have a whole video on incremental thinking and then there are so many new things in technologies but the thing is most of the fundamentals don't change we have the same we are kind of going in cycles that repeat themselves uh, yes, there are some new things, but generally speaking, uh, if we talk about cloud, is this new thing, it's just a new iteration of the mainframe. Same concept, different technology, of course, better automation, diff but similar pricing model, uh, and so on. So it's not really that different. I'm also known to argue that microservices are the new object-oriented, because if you look at what the microservice is and what Alan Kay's vision for objects is, these match very closely together. So then if you're doing microservices, you'd better use design patterns from object-oriented programming and all kinds of things like this. And by fundamentals, we mean you need to be able to write code that can be read and understood and changed by other people. You need to be able to modify the structure of the code without changing its uh, behavior, which is refactoring. You need to be able to uh, validate your code and all these kinds of things uh, that are there. And then the relations between the different elements, the different design elements in your code, they are kind of the same and have been the same for many years. So if you master these fundamentals, the rest is either marketing noise or is indeed a new iteration of the same thing that you've seen before, uh, just slightly adjusted. Uh, oh, this is how it frees you from uh, the limitations. Another set of limiting beliefs that we see come from complaints related to programming adjacent activities. Programmers would like to write code and just write code. And so we hear things like meetings are a waste of time. We don't like to write documentation. Or maybe we don't hear that we don't like to write documentation, but I judge based on results and based on results our systems are heavily under documented everybody complains that there's not enough good documentation for our systems but somehow uh, the people who should write them which is also programmers 
they don't get to it. And if only I could just write code. And the thing is, we love programming, but programming is not all there is. And these are limiting beliefs because they limit you into thinking that, first of all, software development is only coding when it's also collaboration, it's also conversation, it's also understanding users. It's a bunch of things. But on the other hand, it's also limiting you into believing that programming is fully technical. While that is not true, programming is both technical and humanistic in nature. Yes, you need to write code that is technical, that works in technical terms, but you structure and write code for people, you create programs for people. Writing, writing in general, not writing code necessarily, helps you think. And if you think better, you are a better programmer. So you, we have to get over this idea that programming is only technical. In fact, if you look at domain-driven design, this is one of my favorite things. Um, what is domain-driven design about? It's about, at the core, it's about domain modeling, which is building a vocabulary of terms that come from the domain. Well, that is an area of linguistics, it's called the jargon. We are basically building a jargon that we can understand uh, as together with domain experts and we can speak the same jargon. When we say we speak ubiquitous language, the, the correct term or the old term, <laughs> the classical term, let's say, would be we are building a jargon. So that's fundamentally a linguistics process. It's not a technical process. And we can see this in a lot of uh, the domain modeling literature. So yes, programming is both technical and humanistic. We have to get rid of the notion that it's only technical. Another set of complaints uh, goes around the superceived extra technical activities, and they might be perceived as extra because they aren't part of that core we were used to when we started learning programming. I know when I started learning programming that everything was about compilers, about writing the the good syntax about communicating with the with the computer and then seeing some result. And that's how most of uh, about the code. Now what happens in reality is that this part it's less and less important important as the percentage of time that you spend. The more you go to creating software for customers, you see that this might this part of activity might even go down to 10% of your overall time. And this is uh, one one of the, the, the key ideas that maybe it's also about schools and how we start programming. There's uh, a set of limiting beliefs that uh, you, you can see now on the screen, which are about this, about things that I think aren't taught enough in schools, like clean code. It's either that we don't know about it or it's just all the wrong. That's a, a thing I, I keep hearing. And okay, you might not want to use clean code. You might not like the concept, but you need a way to have a code that is easy to change, easy to maintain, and choose those practices, whatever fits your situation, your purpose. Because I did hear complaints about clean code not being that useful for C++ or for other types of uh, languages other than, than object-oriented 
So like functional programming or other scripting or other, other areas like that. But in fact, you do need a way to keep your code clean because if you keep it clean, you will take less time to change it. You will have less defects when changing it. And for you, it will be easier in one month or two or six or 10 or someone else who will look at the code. So th that's the core important thing. Also, another limiting belief is that texts are extra work. Because again, not much in schools, we were taught that we need to test our code uh, that much. It's just, it works on my machine. We test it briefly and we, we say it works. I think there's not a lot of focus on how to think about testing scenarios. It's very limited set of tests that we do. And that's, again, the, the reason why this, there's this perception. Security is a department and design patterns are outdated. These are things that sometimes I hear. Oh, security is a, an area that we need to know a bit and more and more because of today's attacks and more and more security concerns or for almost all software that we do. So I don't think it's like 15 or 20 years ago when security was just optional. Whatever you do, even if you have a, a blog post with your preferred platform, or a blog, uh, sorry, if you have a blog uh, on your preferred platform or you have, if you create a new account, on any platform, you need to think about security. You need to think about passwords. You need to think about encryption keys. You need to think about all the, all of these things. And that's why security cannot be a department anyway, anymore. Design patterns might be outdated because there are some new, well, newer programming languages and yeah, design patterns are come from the 90s and they might not be that useful in those programming languages. But there are parts of them that could be useful. So take what's important, take what's helpful, uh, dis disregard what's not helpful. And as Alex said earlier, if you do use microservice architecture, you might see that quite a few of the design patterns are useful but not in the code, but in the way you look at your architecture and how those microservices communicate and how you attribute responsibilities and how you, you cut off responsibilities between them. So there are many areas where some design patterns are useful. I, th I think quite a few of them are essential. These are limiting beliefs because you are responsible for outcomes and not outputs. Let me get a bit into the difference between outcomes and outputs. Output is the fact that you worked or you, you say, I, I created some code. I wrote some code. I have uh, been or uh, DLL and whatever, you know, I created something. I have a script that I wrote. This is an output. It starts becoming an outcome when it is being used by a user, by a customer, and it brings them value. So it's not enough just saying, I wrote some code, it works on my machine. You need to look how the code is behaving on a uh, production environment with customers involved and if it's helping them. So you also need to get some feedback. And that would be the outcome, the business value that you achieve by putting that code in production. What you can do is start using techniques like clean code or whatever you want to call them, start working on testing your code better, manual, automated, semi-manual with tools, whatever is fits the context. 
start thinking about security as as a skill that you need to have at least a minimum amount of skill to be able to discuss with specialists if if needed but to understand what to do and what not to do with when writing code and also what to do and or not to do when you have passwords you create passwords how you keep passwords because that's the one of one of the big issues that we have today um to help uh developers understand that we need to focus on outcomes and not on outputs we uh want to use this metaphor of lenses of software design think about the code like that does it do what it was supposed to do and i'm not meaning what it was supposed to do necessarily very technical but in from the point of view of the user is it helping the user solving a problem helping in some ways is it easy to change it goes back to the maybe clean code and the design patterns and the cost of change is really important because if you need to do some change it will affect you on in the future can it be breached this the, this is the lens of security mainly but um it's it's also how you write code is it fast enough this is this is the lens of performance testing or or something like that but looking from the context of the usage so it's not just performance testing in vain it's looking at how big the impact on the users is how many users you have how much uh, resources how many resources you need and so on and then also another lens is looking at at it from the point of view of the team can someone else understand it can someone else change it because if it's just you who can change it you most likely to create a bottleneck for the team and again this is preventing the team and yourself from producing outcomes and you'll just have outputs so these are some lenses but there are just a few that you can look at that are really important to to shift from these limiting beliefs to producing software of value and understanding that our main job is not in fact writing code but producing business value yeah and if i can cycle back a little bit on two things one of them for security we have a learning program that has gained quite some traction it was very appreciated called secure coding which helps developers think in this mindset kind of get paranoia plus plus but not as much as security professionals and uh, the second thing is um there's this this lens is it's important to see that it's very hard to look at them all at the time and one of the reasons we are I, we like the lens metaphor is that you have to change the lens so you kind of look through one lens then move to the other then move to the other so you focus on one of these uh you write a piece of code and then you focus on one go to the next go to the next and so on and kind of repeat this process and i think this is the way we should do software development and software design yeah um we offer here programmers linking the right identity to uh programming language uh even more like i hear nowadays i am i'm a microservice developer and uh, there are other limiting beliefs like saying i'm a tdd person or i'm just functional programming i'm just op programming these are all limiting beliefs because in fact what you need to look at is how you use tools to solve problems 
your main role, your main uh, job is to solve problems for the customers and producing this customer value. The more tools you have in your toolbox is that the, is better because you'll be able to solve these problems easier and faster. It's the same with any craftsperson. I'm talking here also about uh, craftspeople who do this on physical work, you know, like carpenters, let's say, who would have a different, uh, a big set of tools for different jobs. And with experience or by with training they got with working side by side with other other people, they learned that some tools are better for a job and some tools are better for another job. It goes the same here. If we look at all these as tools, programming languages are tools. There isn't the perfect program language for everything. There's a good programming language for code, uh, for, for something that needs to run really fast. It's a good programming language for something that is very domain oriented, domain focused. Uh, there are a few good programming languages for microservices, but that's why we have so many programming languages because each of them can be useful in a certain situation. Of course, you can have more tools, more situa situations where you, more tools are appropriate for the job, and that's fine. It's the same uh, going back to carpenters. It's the same because a carpenter might have a preference for a tool, another carpenter for another tool, and they do the same job. So there's no point of debating that situation. It's just that probably there are a set of tools useful for for solving a certain job the same with with everything else like tdd is a tool okay it's not a religion it's not something you should do always it's a tool like anything else you should use it when it's appropriate maybe it's a tool dif difficult to get to understand and you not just need to practice enough, you need to find the, the community around you in your city or online to help you improve this skill. And then you'll see when it makes sense or it doesn't make sense because there's quite a few of, uh, there are a few resources really good on this topic online as well. So this is the, the main thing to, to think that a limiting belief is trying to put yourself into a box while thinking that it's just a tool and you can expand your tool set will help you improve yourself greatly and being able to solve problems a lot faster, a lot more efficiently. And it also helps you avoid weird or useless conversations like TDD. Yeah has died or you know which makes no yeah, sense or, if you think about it as a tool <laughs> or use this scripting language or the other scripting language <laughs> yeah. while it's just a preference so i i want to separate typically these things from is it useful yes or no we can discuss that if the tool is useful it's good for the job and then is it your preference or my preference because if we agree that we have three, four tools good for the job, and you prefer to use that one and I prefer to use the other one, that's great. There's no, there is no issue in this. Let's, let's take, for example, IDs. So if you like to use IntelliJ and I like to use uh, uh, something like, uh, I don't know. Vim. Uh, Vim, okay, that's fine. Okay, you can write code in yours, I can write code in mine. They, it's fine, their IDs, they're great. So if if you say, no, I work in Notepad, I don't know. That's not, maybe not the best tool for the for writing, I don't know, Java or uh, Python or and so on, because it's not helping you enough. Okay. So that, that's the debate I think uh, we need to have. 
Well, the sixth situation is when programmers want to be left alone because, and I, I trace this to the way most programmers have learned programming, which is was by sitting long hours in front of a computer alone while trying to figure out things. And because of this, I think that we end up with these types of complaints. Uh, give me my task. No, I want my task. I want to do my task. I want to end my task and that's it. No, nothing beyond that. Or uh, I don't want to pair with Joe because he's a junior, I'm a senior, he can't teach me anything. So why, you know, why do that? Or a very common one, which is, it's not exactly how developers phrase, but is basically what's underneath it is uh, the daily meetings are boring. And underneath that, what is it? I don't care what my team works on. I don't care what the other people work on, because if I would care what the other people work on, if I would have an interest, then suddenly things are not as boring anymore. <laughs> uh, okay, sometimes maybe m these meetings can be boring. And, yeah. and quite often they are because they're not well facilitated. Well, yeah, when they are not well facilitated, when the rhythm is not fast enough, when you go into too many details. So there are all kinds of things that you can do to make them less boring. but. In the end, it's about interest. If you have interest in what everybody else is doing, you will end up by improving these types of meetings anyway. Um, and okay, these are limiting beliefs because they limit you to a lone runner, to a lone programmer. You are alone in a team you are alone in a group instead of working in a team, more or less. So instead of doing that, what I'm proposing you is a different kind of attitude, the attitude where you step up, where you say, I want the team to be successful. So what are our goals as a team? Let's figure that thing out. And then once we have our goals, do we have all the necessary skills? What do we need to do in order to learn? Can I learn a new skill that can help the team that we don't have right now? Can I help somebody else, you know, take a skill or learn a skill that I have, or maybe we can help each other learn together a skill um, that helps. And also look, I, I learned from everyone. I've done pair programming with a lot of, people who are of different seniority levels and knowledge levels and so on. And it's always been a, an experience from which I get out with something new, something that I, I found out. Uh, it's also useful to think about the, the team. Let's try to conceptualize it this way. What you get as a team is a set of needs and wants, which are very unrefined knowledge. And what you end up with is knowledge that is encoded, that runs on a computer, that the most precise type of knowledge that you can have because a computer doesn't know how to do things that are vague. So that has to be extremely precise. And basically your team you can think about it as a knowledge refinery. It takes in our refined knowledge, it outputs very refined, very precise knowledge. And when you look at things in this way, you realize that the more brains you use for a problem, the more you get out, right? Uh, so not only you will see that it feels better because you are progressing, but you also get more done. And this is why some of the practices that sound very weird in any other discipline, like mob programming or pair programming, work so well in software development. Uh, you couldn't do mob programming in construction, 
right? That would be like one person laying bricks and ten looking at him <laughs> laying bricks. Uh, that would not be very productive. But in programming, when more people look at the same problem, they will get better solutions and often faster than if they would be working alone. So that's the explanation for this paradoxical thing, which means just go with this attitude. I can learn from everyone. I can help anyone who asks for help. I want the team to be successful. Let's start from here. The last and more important one, the seventh, is that we programmers avoid responsibility. This is a limiting belief when we say that it, basically it's not me, it's someone else. And it's either a way of thinking very general, generalizing like the estimates were wrong. We, we talk in a passive voice. Uh, we don't say we didn't estimate well enough or something like we were under pressure, but though that pressure is not, not very clearly defined. Or, of course, what is quite often something or someone else is to blame. This is a problem with blaming others, is that when you do that, is you're basically feeling a bit better. You're putting all the hard uh, consequences of whatever happened on someone else or something else, but you're not solving the problem. You're not solving the situation that might happen the same next time. It's it's the same with, with pref pressure because you look at, we were under pressure and it leaves uh, you powerless. You say, okay, we were under pressure, we cannot do anything. So these are situations where you don't act to improve anything and you're not improving anything from the future. Instead, you can take responsibility. You can learn from whatever happened, try to come up with solutions, with ideas. They might work or not, that's fine if they don't work for the future, but you try to improve things. If something happened, instead of saying uh, that is to blame or the other is to blame, start thinking, how can we improve next time? Instead of saying we were under pressure, think about why we were under pressure. What is that pressure? What does it mean and was it really pressure or was it just something that we felt we perceived as pressure because this is something that happens quite often i'm not saying that there's not quite a huge amount of pressure sometimes in developing software but that software that, that pressure comes from the market from clients from competition and so on so it's just something kind of natural, which occurs and you can use it in your advantage. See how you can use that pressure to improve the best you can. You're limiting yourself by not taking responsibility and what is responsibility? Let me explain that. The term responsibility that I use here comes from a book called The Personal Responsibility Process by Christopher Avery. I'm not going to go into details on this. We have a whole video only on this and maybe it's not enough. I do recommend you to read the book called Personal Responsibility Process and also follow Christopher Avery's excellent information and uh, materials online. There are there there is this idea that Christopher Avery wrote that 
there are different steps on taking responsibility or avoiding it or feeling that you cannot do anything, leaving you powerless. This is based on some research that he did together with his mentor for tens of years, if I'm not mistaken, something like 35, 40 years. And the question was for this research, what does responsibility mean for people? It's a simple question, which as you can see, took a lot of time to answer. What Christopher Avery says is that there are stages that we all can come to when, when trying to be responsible and it happens to everybody. It's not that someone is, uh, is better off. It's just that you can train yourself to understand where you are in these stages of responsibility. There, there is just a, a, there are a few categories. So there are the one on the right, the gray ones, cute, uh, quit and denial where basically you're just outside, just you don't think that you can do anything. You're outside of anything um, meaningful. The other ones on the left, lay blame, justify, shame, and obligation are stages that make you not being responsible. And that's why it's from bottom to top. They have a certain precedence on how they happen and let's say you're a bit more responsible when you feel obligation than when you lay blame even though none of those stages are great anyway taking responsibility means that you will choose to work and to to improve yourself to create value and to to produce something meaningful. This doesn't mean that you will solve all the problems. Of course, it's not possible to solve all the problems that you see around you. You can choose, and that can be something responsible, choose in, in knowing that you chose not to take any action about something because you don't have enough time, you don't have enough energy, you cannot do everything. But it's something that you chose instead of thinking that, hey, it's something that I just, um, I, I don't know about, like being in denial or quitting. So again, there's a video, you'll see it in the description uh, of, this, uh, of this video. Check that out with us talking about responsibility process. It's really interesting. Um, I just want to end up with uh, an example that I, I think it's in his book. I don't remember, but it's a really useful example of how these stages can, can pop up in seconds in our mind. So let's say that I've lost my keys and I'm at the door. I need to hurry. The first thing that uh, pops into my mind is Something like, where did my wife put these keys? So I'm on the lay blame part, okay? I'm laying blame on someone else. This is what happens always with each one of us. You just need to think about this. And then I think, oh no, wait, um, I found them. They were in my pocket. Then I, I start justifying, oh, I'm never tidy enough so I don't put my keys where I should and this is justifying it's like blame laying blame on yourself then you start it's this the shame phase when you, you're ashamed that uh, you lost time on the keys you you can you, you're not worthy of something okay so you, you start being shame uh, shameful and it's about yourself and then you say you, you can end up into obligation, something. Oh, I should, you know, whenever you start with I should, I should put my keys orderly every time in my pocket. But then you can 
you, you un can start understanding the process, the, the stages you pass through, maybe in a few seconds, maybe in five seconds or several seconds. And get to obligate, uh, get from obligation to responsibility, and then understanding that you, it, it's natural that you thought that uh, playing blame was fine, but the fact that it took you only five seconds or ten seconds to go back to responsibility and understanding how to improve yourself for the future—that's the important part. It's bad when you just stay into those lower phases and you, you don't think about improvement. So again, watch the video, read the book. It's really, really important and interesting, useful for, for everybody, I think. Yeah, and I would like to add one more thing, which I think is actionable for many developers. We tend to run away from tasks that we feel or from challenges that we feel we are not ready for. Like a manager comes and tells us, okay, could you do this project or could you do this task in one week? Could you do this project in three months because we really need it in three months? And I think one of the keys for responsibility and one of the things that I'm talking about is even when you are not sure, take the responsibility because they are two outcomes out of it. Either you succeed and then you will surprise yourself that you did better than, than you expected, or you don't succeed, but then you realize what you could have done differently and how you can improve the next time. And that is a lesson that's very difficult to learn in any other way. It's You can read all the books, you can see watch videos with other people, but actually living through this experience is the thing that will help you race to the ch next challenges uh, when they come. So that's, I think, an important part of what it means to take responsibility. All right, let's conclude. Uh, if I were to put this talk in a nutshell, Everyone has limiting beliefs. It's a human thing. But the problem with limiting beliefs is not that you have them, but when they overcome your thoughts, when they become the leading thing in your mind. And those lead you to something that I've often seen, which I call programmer's limbo. It's, is the place for a programmer when they kind of see that it could be better, but they don't have the energy, they don't have the, the grit, the bandwidth to move to that next level. And they often stop believing that it's possible. And this is a way in which, you know, limiting beliefs can kind of carve out your, uh, your energy. But instead, what you can do is to say, oh, so there's this challenge. I'm not sure I can be up to it. Let me try it. Let me try to do that. So take responsibility. And this often, it's not 100%, right? Nobody can <laughs> make this uh, statement. Nobody can tell you you'll definitely succeed. But this is the way we know in which you can succeed, you increase your chances to success. So choose to try things that are outside of what you think you can, and that will lead you to realize your potential and open up opportunities. And with this, thank you very much. Thank you as well. We have a QR code here where you can go and you have a lot more resources on YouTube. You'll also have links, uh, the link in the description to this uh, blog post. It is basically a list of more videos that go into more details about all the things that we discussed uh, here. Uh, so this was uh, the talk. Um, once again, I enjoyed this talk a lot. I think it's an important message for, for anybody in software development to look at and to 
think about and to try. And I'm looking forward to seeing your comments on YouTube about this. Anything you want to add, Adi, before we close? Everything that we said can seem complicated, especially if you're starting in this journey or if you if you have maybe a a blockage in whatever you want to do uh, with software development. Uh, try to take it one by one. It might seem overwhelming. Again, if you take it one by one, I think step by step, baby steps, uh, you will see that gradually you improve your ability to produce quality software. You feel better about yourself. You'll feel better about your work. And a lot of things uh, will improve. It's only only get, getting better. The only thing is to, to think that you can improve these things. But if you believe that, if you take steps on this, it's great. All right. So thank you, Adi, for joining me for this talk. Thank you as well. And uh, so this was uh, this Saturday's video. Uh, what do you think about all this? Remember, we love comments. Uh, leave us some comments. We love to start a conversation around these things. Is there anything that captured your attention? Anything that maybe we didn't touch upon? Anything that wasn't very clear? One of the perks of this channel is that from one, a question in comments, you might end up with a video that answers your question. As we have seen recently with a whole conversation around confusions on test-driven development. Um, so leave us some comments. Thank you kindly for the view. And until next time, remember to think, design, and work smart. See you next Saturday.